Good evening, friends. Welcome to our scripture reading. I hope you can hear me. In fact, we took a break because of the feast of Padre Pio and the preparations that are involved. So, welcome back. Today is day 25 of our scripture reading. And tonight we shall continue from the Gospel of Luke from chapter 4. Gospel according to Luke chapter 4. Let us begin the scripture reading by signing ourselves. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, from chapter 4. The Temptation of Jesus Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Then the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, will it all be yours? Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him and serve only him. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will give command his angels concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. The Beginning of the Galilean Ministry Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. The Rejection of Jesus at Nazareth When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me, to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, and there was a severe famine all over the land, famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow in Zarephath in Sidon. 
There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The Man with an Unclean Spirit He went on to Capernaum, a city in Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. They were astounded at his teaching, because he spoke with authority. In the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Let me alone. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. When the demon had thrown him down before them, he came out of him without having done, done him any harm. They were all amazed and kept saying to one another, What kind of utterance is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and out they come. And the report about him began to reach every place in the region. Healings at Simon's House After leaving the synagogue, he entered Simon's house. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him about her. Then he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Immediately she got up and began to serve them. As the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with the various kinds of diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on each of them and cured them. Demons also came out of many, shouting, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew that he was the Messiah. Jesus preaches in the synagogues. At daybreak he departed and went into a deserted place, and the crowds were looking for him, and when they reached him, they wanted to prevent him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. So he continued proclaiming the message in the synagogues of Judea. The Gospel of the Lord Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dear friends, we just completed chapter 4 of the Gospel according to Luke. I hope you can hear me now clearly. If not, let me know. I will try to adjust the sound. Now, first we see temptation of Jesus. Now, Jesus was led by the Spirit to the wilderness. He was there for 40 days. Those 40 days only we commemorate during the time of Lent. You know, we also go through what Jesus went through, fasting, prayer and penance and so on. And for four, after 40 days, the devil strikes at the weakness of Jesus. Now the weakness of Jesus here was his hunger. You remember I said to you, Jesus is not 50% human, 50% divine. No, 100% human and 100% divine. So as a human being, he was hungry because he has not eaten anything for 40 days. Now, the devil knows that he is hungry and he will do anything. Like, you know, if you are hungry, you will do anything in order to get food. You know, people go to any extreme. So whereas here, the devil is striking at the weakest point of Jesus, that is his human need, food. And what he does, he comes and loads up his statement. If you are the son of God, command this stone to become loaf of bread. Now, Jesus could have done that. Certainly, if he wanted, he could have done that. But if he were to do at the command of devil, he is submitting himself to the authority of the devil, 
come what may no matter what happens he is not going to listen to the devil now in our life too the devil knows exactly our weakest point where we are weak at the devil cannot do anything with our strengths say for example you have a great ability to be patient he can't do anything at the same time say you have impatience you get anger you get temper short tempered now devil knows what is our weakness exactly he will strike at that now here jesus was hungry he comes and says change this stone into a loaf of bread he refuses to do that now what did he answer it is written one does not live by bread alone now he will go further by saying but by every word that comes from the mouth of god so we to live not by bread alone in our life but every word that comes from the mouth of god the word of god keeps us alive and then the second temptation the devil led him up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world and the devil said to you i will give their glory and all this authority and it has been given over to me and i give it to anyone i please well sometimes the devil does give authority to people whom he please now we need to remember it's not all the rulers all the people who are chosen all the people who are monarchs all the people who are prime ministers or presidents of various nations are the people who are chosen by god no that is why we see in the way that they govern the country in the way that they go about in their governing of the people if they make the laws fearing god we know very well that they are chosen by god but there are also rulers in this world people in authority who go completely against god and his will then we know who chose them to be in authority here it is the devil saying it all it has been given to me i give it to anyone i please these are the evidences that there are people who rule the world different countries different territories appointed by the devil and when they are appointed by the devil definitely all the rules and the regulations that they will carry out or enact as laws will be following the instructions of the devil and then what this what did this devil say to jesus if you then will worship me it will all be yours how dare how dare this stupid devil telling the son of god you have to worship me worship me forget about just giving respect or uh, giving reverence or listening worship me how dare he says to jesus and jesus he doesn't get angry he doesn't get upset he quotes the scripture it is written worship the lord your god and serve only him very clear so no worshiping of devils there are a lot of people think that by worshiping the devil they can get whatever they want in their life they do get the riches from the earth but they will not get the any riches from heaven the third one and also my dear friends the second temptation is loaded with the other thing like jesus has come there to the world as a human being in order to save the world to go through the suffering and the devil knows about it that he is a messiah now how to win the whole world by himself is by going through the suffering as a suffering messiah whereas the devil didn't want him in the beginning from the beginning the devil is trying to prevent jesus going through the suffering death on the cross and ultimate resurrection because if jesus goes through all that he will be victorious over the devil he will be victorious over sin so the devil didn't want him to go through that he wanted jesus to fail now in what way is it the thing that you want the kingdoms everything that is in the world you have come to save them here it is i will give it to you you don't have to suffer you don't have to die you don't have to be crucified nothing 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 all that is needed of you is to worship me 
So he is giving Jesus a shortcut. But how ridiculous this devil is. Now Jesus doesn't listen. And the third one, the devil takes him to Jerusalem. Okay? That is to the temple. To the pinnacle of the temple. He didn't go in. He cannot, the devil cannot get into the temple. Only he took him to the pinnacle of the temple. Saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written. Now for a change. Now so far Jesus twice, the first two temptations if you notice. Jesus quotes the scripture. Holy scripture by answering the devil. Right? Now here, the devil quotes the scripture. He says, make him to stand. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written in the scripture. He will command his angels concerning you to protect you and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. So he quotes the scripture. So far Jesus has been defeating the devil by quoting the scripture. Now for a turn he also quotes the scripture which means the devil knows the scripture. Sometimes people, all the people who are quoting the scripture are not divine. Please understand that there are people who are having hand in gloves with the devil and they twist and turn the Holy Scripture in order to suit their ideology by which we can come to know that they are not working along with God's will but they are working along with the devil's will. Now what did Jesus say? Jesus answered him, it is said, he quotes the scripture third time, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Now this statement is not only for the devil. But also this statement is for some devilish people who put God to test. They push him to his limit. Who are we to test God? Can we even stand in front of his presence? Do we know the mightiness of God? The power of God? We are not even a speck of dust in the scheme of things that God has created. And we try to put God to the test? That is the most ridiculous thing that anybody can do in the world. Putting God to the test. And when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. We are going to see that. When is that opportune time? Now, Jesus is becoming stronger and stronger by quoting the scripture. He didn't eat that stone, you know, to make, by making it bread. He didn't yield to the pressure to get the power back by a short way. And also he didn't oblige to him to jump off so that he can show off his power. No, he didn't. He didn't yield to those temptations. Those temptations also came to him in a way that he can save this world not going through the suffering and death on the cross. Whereas he fights all the temptation. So he is strong at the time. So the devil withdraws. He withdraws so that he can come back at an opportune time wherein Jesus will be at the weakest again. And then we see the beginning of Galilean ministry. In Galilee he begins so beautifully. Now Jesus filled with the power of the spirit. The, whole, the evil spirit is gone. So he is filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. He returned to Galilee from the wilderness. And a report about him spread through all the country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Why wouldn't it be? He is a word. He is a logos. You know when he speaks it's God speaking. And definitely everybody will be praising. But at the same time there are people who did not accept Jesus. We see that. It is very unfortunate even the people of Nazareth, the, pe where, the place where he grew up, even those people did not accept him. And he quotes the scripture there. Now he goes to Nazareth on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet was given to him, prophet Isaiah. It was so apt to the situation. It was so appropriate to the situation. Now the very purpose of his ministry is revealed 
in that synagogue on that day in, in Nazareth. Now what did he read? Look at the powerful words of prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. The poor doesn't mean, you know, as soon as we hear of uh, poor, we think of only the people who do not have money as poor. Of course, they are poor. But poor of spirit as well. The people who lack God, people who don't know God, people who are don't know, like they are struggling with hopelessness. Uh, all the people who are deprived of every way, any blessing, we are considered to be poor. And to bring good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. Now to proclaim is not only merely saying or shouting or screaming, no. Proclamation is powerful, powerful declarations. Release to the captives. What are we kept? What are they captured of? Sinfulness. And recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of Lord's favor. Now, Prophet Isaiah also mentioned that blind will see, deaf will hear, the, the dead will be raised to life, and the good news will be proclaimed when the Messiah comes. Now all these things will be taking place during Jesus' time. And then he rolled up the scroll. See, very, very, it's, a, you know, some of the phrases have got a lot of uh, richness in it. It's not just like that it is written. You see the details. Okay, now he has read that from prophet Isaiah. Then Jesus himself rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down okay now one may wonder why he rolled up the scroll now rolled up the scroll means now where did he read from prophet Isaiah now where is that from from the Old Testament now what is happening Old Testament is complete now comes Old Testament is complete he rolled up Old Testament is complete now comes New Testament. Now where it is coming? From the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. He rolled up, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Now sitting down is authority. When you teach, when the church teaches from the cathedra. Now what is a cathedra? Cathedra is a chair of the bishop. So in every cathedral, there is a cathedra. Cathedra means the chair of the bishop. That is a teaching authority of the bishop. So even for the pope, there is a chair of the pope. Now for the present pope, the chair of the pope is kept in St. John the Lateran Basilica because he is known as the bishop of Rome. So St. Peter's chair is St. Peter's. St. Peter's Basilica has a chair that is the papacy. But technically he is also the Bishop of Rome. When you go next time to Rome, go to St. John the Lateran Basilica, you will look at a chair, a huge chair. That is the chair of Bishop of Rome. The Pope is the Bishop of Rome. So too in every cathedral of every diocese there is a chair which is called the cathedra. Okay, that is a teaching authority. Now Jesus sat down so to speak, he begins a new ministry, a new mission of the church. He sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. You see what happens? We read the gospel during the mass and everybody sits down after the gospel. Right? Now where, does, where do we pay the attention to after that? One, one who is delivering the word of God. One who is breaking open the word, one who gives the homily. So here too, the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, this is breaking open the word. Now how did he do that? Now explanation of the scripture is doing. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It is coming true. 
It is a momentous time. Now what is what did they hear just now? To bring good news to the poor? To proclaim release to the captives? The recovery of sight to the blind? To let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of Lord's favor? This is the proclamation that is to be done in the church through the Gospels. Now the Gospels are all designed, no matter what Gospel you read, no matter which passage you take, they are designed to explain one of these or all of these elements in the Gospel. Because this is the proclamation. Now, every Gospel will have element that is to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives in different ways. Captives doesn't mean those who are in the prison only. No. Even people who are going through addictions in their problem, in their life. Or people who are going through different issues in their life. Or psychological trauma. You know, anything that is capturing a man or a woman in their life, not allowing them to be free human beings. So they are all captives in a way. Or recovery of sight to the blind. Not only the physical blindness, but also spiritual blindness. People failing to see what God is doing. Even that, the gospel is throwing the light upon those things. And the third one, and the next one is to let the oppressed go free. Social justice. Issues in the world. And to proclaim the year of Lord's favor. The year of Lord's favor is you know, you know, what we call the Jubilee. Jubilee is the year of the Lord's favor. There are so many different jubilees that we celebrate, different times. So this is all designed in such a way, all the above said things will be happening on the jubilee. Okay, so that is what Jesus said. Today, the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. As you hear, this is happening right now. It is present. He is talking about himself. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. And then they begin to question, is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, doubtless you will quote me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. You see, Jesus is predicting at the very beginning of his ministry, he is predicting what they will be saying to him when he is hanging on the cross at the end of his ministry. Didn't they say, he saved others. Now he couldn't save himself. Come down from the cross. We will believe in you. Didn't they say that? Look, he is already predicting that. So he is saying, you will quote me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. Means he saved others. Now save yourself. You see, Jesus knows, my dear friends, everything. And then you will say, do here also in your hometown things that we have heard you did at Kapanau. Same, mocking him. And he said, truly I said, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. It is very true, my dear friends. It is very true. Sometimes we do not give recognition for the people who are very close to us when they speak about God. Priests, bishops, nuns, popes, cardinals, anyone, or missionaries, when they speak the word of God to the people who are really close to them, they do not accept them. That is why he said, the prophets, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. Whereas outside they are recognized. Far away places they are recognized. Look at the apostles. Look at great missionaries who came to our own countries. They didn't remain in their own place. Whereas when they came to other places, they were recognized. That is why the church, of course they were persecuted. That's a different thing altogether. Whereas they were recognized. They were heard to. That is why the church spread. But he says, but the truth is, he is attacking them now. <laughs> he started off. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah. So in the Old Testament, right? There were many widows during that time in Israel. Israel, the chosen ones. When the heaven was shut up for three years and six, and six months, imagine there was no rain for three years and six months. What a pathetic condition it would have been. And there was a severe famine all over the land, yet Elijah was sent to none of them except the widow 
at Zarephath in Sidon. So it is not to the people who are chosen, who consider themselves to be the chosen race, the royal priesthood, the holy nation, the people set apart, but to a Zarephath widow in Sidon, outcast. So that really infuriates them because they are not recognized by the prophet there at the time. Whereas somebody out there in a faraway place was recognized. And, and then he says there were many lepers in Israel. Again, Israel, the chosen ones in the time of prophet Elisha. So not only Elijah but also Elisha. And none of them was cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. <laughs> so that makes these people of Israelites, you know, the people who are sitting there in the synagogue, the Jews, who considered themselves to be chosen, how did they feel when they heard this? All in the synagogue were filled with rage, anger, rage. You know, we hear of road rage, here synagogue rage, <laughs> rage. They got up drove him out of the town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. They wanted to kill him. They really wanted to kill him that day. Because he pointed out, you are not considered by God. You are not considered by the prophets. Well, that is the truth. He told, he started off in truth. The truth is, truth is bitter. But that will give life, that will save life. People don't want to listen to truth. But you know, lately I've been noticing, slowly people are speaking up. It's catching up. You cannot bottle up the sun's light. The darkness can be there. Even if you fill the whole world with the darkness, if you light a single candle, that flame, the whole darkness cannot defeat the light and the brightness of that flame. That is the power of truth. It can be small. It can be very, very insignificant. But still truth is truth. So that is why I always say stand by the truth. You know, raise your voice for truth. There is so much of things that is out there. So much of darkness. The woke culture, the cancel culture, the death culture. Putting down men and women and families and everything, putting down God. All these things happen, but still the truth is truth. So now here what happens, they wanted to take him to the brow of the hill and they wanted to throw him off, but he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. What a guts! <laughs> what guts he has got! All that crowd, he is all by himself. Remember, he is all by himself in that synagogue there all by himself alone but we need to remember a truth you look at lion lion goes for hunting all by himself you know who goes in a group in a mob mentality pigs pigs go in a big group they go and tear apart and destroy and do all the nonsense whereas the lion will go single-handed Okay, so here Jesus, the lion, Jesus the lion, nice phrase, isn't it? Jesus the lion, who can stop him? Okay, and then we see man with an unclean spirit. So he goes to Capernaum from there, from Nazareth. He comes to Capernaum, a city in Galilee, and he was teaching them in the sub on the Sabbath. So he's teaching, he's continuing to do that. And the people there in Galilee, they were astounded. Whereas here, just before that, we see people revolting against him. Whereas here, they are astounded by his teaching. Because he spoke with authority. The divine authority. You know, that is one of the things that is lacking in the church today. People are becoming more and more sorry for their faith. Why are you sorry for your faith? Why are you feeling bad in what you believe? You believe in God, 
stand up for your faith. Especially I notice even good Catholics, they become very timid, very cowardice. I don't know why. Don't you know how to defend your faith? How to defend your way of life? Well, equip yourself. If you are ashamed of your own faith, why do you follow? Leave. It is not about numbers. The church, when it is worried about the numbers, it is getting into all sorts of problems. When the church is really worried about the numbers, it is not true to herself. No. The church cannot be worried about the quantity. It should be worried about the quality. Pope Emeritus Benedict, he said, the future church, he is very prophetic. He said the future church will be smaller but holier. It is so true. Ask yourself one question. Are you a church goer or are you a disciple? Answer that question to yourself. Are you a church goer or are you a disciple? If you are a disciple of Jesus, your life will be completely different. You follow where he goes. You do what he does. You follow what he told you to follow. If you are a church goer, your faith is only on a Sunday for one hour. Doesn't make any meaning. You might as well not come. Don't waste that one hour in your life. Go for partying previous night. You can sleep in. Have an extra sleep on Sunday. If you are merely a church goer. Anybody can come to a church. But it takes some disciple to proclaim the gospel. To live the gospel. That's what we need. There are too many church goers in every parish. But we have very few disciples. Very few. And it is pathetic sometimes that people not ready to proclaim their proclaim their faith. <laughs> what are you ashamed of? Anyway, let's not go in. Here, Jesus, he spoke with authority. Divine authority. Authority doesn't mean domination, no. But you need to have authority. You need to really stand up. You need to know your truth to speak and you should be convinced of it you don't have to know the whole bible don't fear it's not knowing the whole scripture no but the more that you read the more that you will understand the more that you understand more that you will know that less that you know <laughs> am i confusing you let me explain again the more that you read the scripture more you will understand the more that you understand more you will discover that you don't know and you will read more it's so much of richness my dear friends in that in the scripture so he spoke with authority in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon so the devil was haunting him and he is there in him and he cried out with a loud voice now when the holy spirit is in you whatever you speak are the words of the Holy Spirit. If the devil is in you, whatever you speak comes from the devil. You understand? Now this man has a devil, so he cries out. What did he cry out? He says, let us alone. <laughs> he says, leave us alone. Leave us at peace. Why are you coming to disturb us? Leave us alone. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. He's saying, the devil is saying, well, the people may not know who you are. I know who you are. The devil said, telling God, the son of God there, the holy one of God. I know who you are, the holy one of God. It's a pity the people with the six senses, they didn't understand Jesus and they wanted to throw him off the hill just before that. Whereas here the devil is recognizing, I know who you are, the Holy One of God, Holy One. I will explain to you later, Holy One of God, One God, 
okay holy one of god but jesus rebuked him he doesn't allow him to talk he doesn't see you don't negotiate with the devil two people in the world you shouldn't negotiate two people one a devil two a terrorist because you don't get anywhere if you submit to both of them you are surrendering to them if you surrender to any of them whether it is a devil or a terrorist you're gone he is one he has defeated you by terror the other one is defeated you by trick and they will continue to do that once the world submits to terrorism what happens is that they know that terrorism will work and they will continue to do that again and again so you don't negotiate now here jesus doesn't allow him to talk he rebukes him he rebuked him saying be silent and come out of him scripture is very sometimes you know very uh, soft he would have said shut up you idiot devil shut up you know be silent <laughs> it's put there be silent jesus doesn't respect the devil but many a times you know we negotiate to the devil you know how do we negotiate like say for example you got a temptation or you got some addiction in your life okay like say some people have got addiction to uh, drugs or alcohol or something or even cigarettes or something like that now the devil is tempting you ha ah, take it today is saturday evening friday evening take it tomorrow you got a day to sleep in what are you worried about just enjoy it now if you take it in moderation if you know how to say no that's fine whereas some people look for an opportunity to be addicted again and again now what do they do they negotiate with the devil that is tempting in them they say okay one shot one pig okay one of these if you are addicted if you cannot say no then don't start don't do anything you should be able to have control of your own feelings never allow any sort of feeling to control you come what may whatever may be the feeling in the world do not allow the feelings because feelings are always changing you do not have the same feeling all the time keep the things that is permanent in your life all the time be addicted to it now what are we capable of being addicted to even god's love that's a very good addiction be addicted to god's love it is good for you for you and for me be addicted to god's love be addicted to love god in return that is a good addiction whereas people don't do that whereas they want to be addicted to all other things that controls and destroys their life destroys the life of other people who are dependent on them that jesus doesn't allow now he says be silent and come out of him when the demon had thrown him down before them and came out of him without having done him any harm they were all amazed and kept saying to one another what kind of utterance is this for with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits and out they come earlier the devils were not listening to any sort of sorcerers or magicians here comes jesus with authority and power the real authority and power the divine power and divine authority and the report about him began to reach every place in the region so it becoming more and more popular and then he comes to simon's house and he cures the mother in law of jesus there too you see we look at jesus as a meek and humble of heart very soft spoken we keep him you know very goody goody very nice very soft very gentle of course he is very soft and very gentle when it comes to matter of god's work he is a lion he doesn't allow anything to overcome the human life now he rebuked the devil right he rebuked the devil he is rebuking the sickness here look at that now what happens when when he was told that the mother in law of simon was sick with a fever then he stood over her and rebuked the fever he didn't say fever could you please come out no political correctness there <laughs> here in australia we are so busy 
we are so busy you know what i cannot understand one thing in australia we are politically right when we speak the you know words if i were you i would do that oh my god just tell the person just do it fear of being sued for anything and everything so in that bargain we don't help each other we don't speak our mind out whereas at the same time i have seen people swearing at one another where is that political correctness coming from hmm i cannot understand that whenever we speak we speak with so much of politeness please thank you could you please would you like to and then they go f this and f that and all that where is that coming from that is what we should be ashamed of and people the parents teaching the children how to swear seriously people you only want the child to learn please and thank you right even if somebody gives them a little chocolate or something what do you say the child should ask you back what should you say should you say swear words in front of children not only in front of children even behind children stop doing that and then big thing like as if you are teaching all the great things to the children parents say what do you say and then the child has to say thank you and then their parents are happy i have brought up the child in a best way possible the child knows how to say thank you ridiculous and then some little argument with your wife or with your husband you go with all the swear words that time the child is deaf and blind can't see you can't hear you right anyway <laughs> sometimes you know we don't understand what we are doing seriously we do more damage by our deliberate acts at home homes are the first schools so teach right things there okay now he rebuked the fever and it left her he didn't request he rebuked it and it left her and what she does she gets up and began to serve them and and sun was setting all those who had sick people various diseases and everybody is brought to him and he laid hands on them and cured them all demons also came out shouting you are the son of god <laughs> the devils couldn't help but to recognize jesus everywhere because they know him right you see already we have seen that in um, in galilee i know who you are though you are the holy one of god now he is coming to simon's place and then there he is curing so many people again they are shouting you are the son of god but he rebuked them <laughs> rebuked them again <laughs> and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the messiah they knew he was the messiah how great is that it's really amazing my dear friends the devil knows god very well people don't know god even now even now the devils know god people don't know god that is a tragedy after 2000 years also and you and i are responsible not making it known and then we go across jesus preaches in the synagogues so he goes to a number of places at daybreak he departed and went to into a deserted place and the crowds were looking for him and when they reached him they wanted to prevent him from leaving we see that earlier when he spoke about you know in nazareth they wanted to throw him off they wanted to get rid of him whereas here since he has done so many miracles among them they want to prevent him from leaving and they wanted to hold him back they wanted to control him or oh, remain here you know don't go anywhere else keep giving us those miracles keep doing those nice things that we are watching you doing you know people always love some fascinating things they want new new things now jesus is doing such a wonderful miracles so they wanted to hold him you know god is not a private property you cannot say god is only for me only for my family no you are limiting god and his power is god he belongs to everybody the more that you give god to others more god will remain with you that's a nice statement i should write that on the facebook status the more that you share god with others the more he will remain with you okay and the more that you give the more you will receive 
that also you should write on the facebook <laughs> okay so what he said to them i must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of god to the other cities also he was a man in a hurry he was a man with a mission and he had the vision of the future church and he has to initiate in all those places he has to give because the humanity has been waiting for centuries for this moment so he couldn't contain himself to one particular city he wanted to get the things done so here he says i must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of god to the other cities also i'm going to come to that what is what does it mean to be kingdom of god to the other cities also for i was sent for this purpose this is the purpose what proclaiming the kingdom of god so he continued proclaiming the message in the synagogues of judea now talking about the kingdom of god good news of the kingdom of god now what is it the kingdom of god is that complete authority of god over every human soul every human soul and what god wants to be done in the world that is what jesus said let your kingdom come so in order to welcome god's kingdom into our world into our life we need to let our kingdom go now message of the gospel the message the good news that's the gospel about the kingdom of god is that god is loving father he is saving you through jesus christ and by your belief in jesus christ you receive gratuitous gift which is called salvation you get it so it goes in a beautiful circle is the kingdom of god which is proclaimed by jesus christ by having belief in jesus christ you get into the kingdom of god now what we need to do we need to give to others as well you and i should proclaim because he expects us by our baptism not by ordination ordination is a full time job once you are ordained you have got to proclaim the gospel whole life whole time whereas by baptism all of us are called to be proclaimers all of us are con- called to be evangelists now evangelist doesn't mean that you go, go and say sorry for your faith in that case don't be evangelist be at home be in the comfort of your home don't do anything because you are doing damage to the faith if you are really convinced of what god has done for you if you are grateful truly grateful for what god has done for you you will go and tell others what god has done for you right that's all the proclamation of the gospel is about so you cannot contain you have to give it to others and when you do that what happens to you you become a witness you become a disciple you see a church goer is different from a disciple there are plenty of church goers very few disciples in the church okay so it's almost 10 o'clock i think we have completed only one one chapter today but it was good that we go through in depth you know we need to know what we are reading and next time when you read the scripture you will remember what i said you know it will come alive you see how how alive is the word of god my dear friends this is all written 2000 years ago the gospel of luke is written 2000 years ago how alive is that huh you read a novel or you watch a movie second time you know everything this is a difference between the word of god and a novel if you read a novel second time or third time fourth time you will know it by heart you will be fed up they will be mere words after that you won't pay attention your mind will be somewhere else you will be just reading where's the word of god if i go through the same chapter again i can find more richness there i can explain completely differently this is the richness of the word of god that is how many people have spoken before me about the same chapter that we read for the last 2000 years how many people must have spoken how many saints how many church fathers 
right? How many priests, bishops and cardinals and popes have lived in this world? How many missionaries? How many people? How many parents would have read this? How many individuals would have read this and reflected? How many YouTube videos are made on this? <laughs> or TikTok videos these days? Right? In spite of all that, there is something new there. You look at all their messages, they will be completely different from me. And I will be different from them. Because God speaks. Now, if you, re if you proclaim the gospel, the same chapter 4 of gospel of Luke, you will interpret it completely different. Because God reveals himself differently to every individual. That we need to understand that. That is the beauty of God. I don't know how he does it, but he does it so well. Thanks be to God for the revelation that he gives us separately to every individual, the way that he reveals. That is why the word of God, like St. Paul puts it, like, you know, it's like a double-edged sword. You know, the knife, it's different from sword. Knife has got blade only one side. The other side it will not cut. Whereas a sword is double-edged. Both the side. This side as well as this side. So you can go slashing this way also and this way also. Both ways it will work in the same way. That is called double-edged sword. How beautiful. That's the word of God. So it has impact. Great impact. So my dear friends, with that I will stop. And if you want, just go through again. Tomorrow we shall have at the same time at 9 o'clock in chapter 5 we will start. Okay, so be courageous, please. Uh, think about what I said. Don't be a church goer. No, be a disciple. Be a disciple. Now Jesus did not say to his disciples at the end of his mission, go to the whole world, proclaim the gospel, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son. You know where he, and of the Holy Spirit. You know what he said? Go and make disciples, he said. He didn't say, go and make church goers. Going to church is part of the life of a disciple. That's the first requirement. Whereas it's more than that. Okay, you go there to receive something and come back and do what? And then again go on Sunday. Some people don't even bother going on Sunday. I don't know. I don't know really what they are thinking. How are they going to go into heaven? Do they want to go to heaven? If you ask them, they will say, yes, yes, we are going to heaven. Okay, how? Have you read the manual book? How to get into heaven? No. Okay. How are you going to do it? Have you been receiving sacrament to be part of God's life? No. Alright. So how are you living your life? There's a lot to think about. Well, are you so busy that you cannot go to the church? Or that you are not able to get there? You can't drive yourself like little children? I won't blame, I never blame little children for not coming to church. I blame the older parents. You know why? The children don't drive themselves. So too there are a number of elderly people in the world who cannot get to the church. Because nobody is there to take them. But God is certainly present with them. But if you can drive, if you can go to the church, you go for birthday parties, you go for wedding parties and all other things. And you are making all other things as a top priority, not God. You expect to go to heaven? Great. Let's see how that one works. Okay, I'll stop with that. We'll see you tomorrow at the same time. Keep the faith and the faith will keep you. Good night and God bless you.